There we go. Great. Um, thank you for the reminder on that, Colleen. So yes, because we want to be able to share this out, and Colleen has also offered to share the slides that she will be sharing throughout this afterward. So I'm um, really excited to be able to get that to people who can't be with us live. Um, so feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat where you're calling in from would be great to to hear from folks. And if you have any questions, you can also put those in the chat and then we'll have time for that at the end, but feel free to drop them in whenever and I'll kind of keep an eye on that. Um, so I'm going to introduce Colleen. Colleen is coming to us from the Renewable Energy Alaska Project, where she's been since 2016. Pretty cool. Um, and she serves as the energy education director. So she works with educators across the state to prepare them to work with students on energy lessons and activities and implemented the Alaska Energy Smart and Wind for Schools curriculum um, in K through 12 classrooms and leads teacher training. So pretty, pretty cool. I'm very excited to hear about all of this. Um, but tonight she's also gonna give us an overview of the energy landscape of Alaska and some insight into upcoming projects. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you, Colleen. Thank you, Alex. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much for hosting this and inviting me to be here today. Go ahead and get my slides up and going here. And make sure. Okay, seeing that all right? Looks good. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pull up the chat on my other um monitor here so I can kind of keep an eye out. So if you guys have questions, please do put those in the chat. I'll do my best to kind of um, keep my eye on those and uh, answer them as we go. But hopefully we'll also have time at the end to be able to talk about this and if there's other things that we go. So thank you. Uh, yeah, that was a great intro. I'm Colleen Fisk. And I am also on Denina Elmena. I live outside Benta, which is Wasilla, Alaska. And Benta means among the lakes, which I think is like a really cool way of describing a very wet area. <laughs> like that's basically swamps and uh, lakes, but it is a really beautiful area. I love living here. I grew up here as well uh, outside of Wasilla, about 20 minutes from where I grew up. And really want to acknowledge when we talk about resources that these are the stewards of the lands that have been taking care of these resources for thousands of years. And so we want to make sure that we're appreciating that indigenous knowledge and wisdom um, that has already been developed and that we are utilizing that when we are talking about resources as well and highlighting their voices. So REAP, Renewable Energy Alaska Project, we're a nonprofit, here's our mission. And I, of course, work focus on the education side of things, but we also do have some advocacy and collaboration and training, of course, overlaps with all of these. We think about uh, clean energy. We define that as efficiency and renewable. So when I say clean energy, I know that term can mean different things to different people. But when I'm talking about that term of clean energy today, I'm talking about efficiency and renewable energy combined, um, like not nuclear or natural gas or anything like that, specifically efficiency and renewables. And so when we want to advance clean energy in the state, we think about it in these four pillars of technology, funding, policy, and people. And actually at the end, I'm going to go into those four a little bit more about some of the like solutions that we are seeing and that we would like or that we would like to see happening within the state and the United States as well. But today, um, to kind of get us started, so this is the overview of the things that I want to talk about today, how we use energy, kind of the general ecosystems that we see within the state, um, our non-renewable resources, our clean energy resources, and then those solutions through that lens of those four pillars to be able to advance it in the state. So that's the overview. So if you have questions about something that is coming up, um, maybe I'll answer it. Um, but of course, like I said, feel free to drop it in the chat. And it is a pretty small group. So if you're like not necessarily someone who can type really fast, you just want to like raise your hand <laughs> as well uh, with the little digital raise hand tool. Happy to also pause what I'm talking about too, uh, if it's relevant to chat. So 
Jumping right into our energy use. So how do we use energy in Alaska? And um, I haven't seen, if you guys can put in the chat where you're joining from, that will also help me that I can kind of focus some of the things I talk about. If like everybody, if almost everybody's like from Anchorage, Fairbanks or whatever, that'll also help me as I go. Um, but our energy use, I'm going to talk about it in terms of all of Alaska as well. And so uh, the Energy Information Administration, EIA, has the data there, um, have their final data is about three years behind from there. It takes them like three years to really approve and finalize the data. So this is from 2020. And so, but it's pretty similar from year to year. And we are, uh, when we look at how we use energy by the sector, industrial include, and which um, includes things like mining, oil, gas, tourism, fisheries, um, our fisheries might be more commercial, but a lot of that you think about industrial, that's a big portion of our energy use, so 60%. And then we have commercial at 7%, so like commercial buildings, uh, for example, residential is about 7%. And then transportation is 27%. And so if you, uh, anybody have an idea of why they think transportation might be so high? Any thoughts? Throw it in the chat or unmute. Out there. Should have warned you, this is an interactive presentation where I ask you guys questions. So you can't just sit there and listen. Does that include like barges? Yeah, uh, barges. Yep. So barges and um, also aircraft. So if you think about uh, Anchorage is actually depending on the year, like the top five uh, cargo airport in the world, and they do the refueling there. So that's another big one. You think about like any type of fueling that happens for those barges, for those airplanes. Um, and of course, we have a really big state where we have to fly a lot of places. So all of that is included in transportation. So that's a really big uh, energy use that may be surprising. Katie says plugging in cars. Yep. So that's starting to see more of that, although not necessarily a huge part of that pie yet, but definitely seeing more electric vehicles. And so um, we think about our residential energy use. So if we're thinking just within that kind of small slot of that 7%, what is our biggest energy use within our homes? So not, not including transportation because we're thinking like the house. And so outside of that, yeah, heating, nice. So heating is by far our largest energy use. So um, no matter where you are in the state, uh, anywhere from Southeast at 69% to interior at 77%, it's a huge part of our energy use of space heating. Then we also have appliances and water heating uh, that are using up a lot of energy. And so everywhere in the state, and that can be even up to 90% of energy costs in some rural communities. So this can really impact people differently depending on where they live or their source of heating. Now for our electricity, again, making you guys answer questions. I'll slow down here in a little bit, but just trying to like quiz it, seeing how people are thinking about this too. Uh, so this is a graph showing uh, these blue bars are the source of electricity. So like coal, oil, natural gas, hydro, that sort of thing. So what do you think this biggest bar is of Alaska statewide electricity generation? What source what fuel do you think that is coming from? Okay, oil. See one guess in there, good. All right. Hydro, mm-hmm. Oh, Alicia, great to join. I'm glad you're joining us from Oregon. A lot of family in Oregon too. Yeah. Okay. Great. So it's saying some good guesses here. Um, so natural gas is by far the largest source with hydro second. Um, and depending on the time of year, these might be a little bit closer where hydro and natural gas are a little bit more evenly um, matched because of you know water source, spring melt, that sort of thing. They might be more evenly matched different times of year. Natural gas is generally the most 
uh, most of our electricity in South Central down here where, where I live, so Ape Matsu, Anchorage, Kenai Peninsula, like 85% of our electricity is coming from natural gas. And they also use natural gas on the North Slope for their electricity and their extraction. Okay, ooh, a couple of Oregon folks. Nice. Yeah, and so this is our total electricity, you know, for the state. Um, and then hydro, we have that here in South Central, also Southeast. And then when you see the petroleum, that's like your oil. And that's where you see most in rural communities that are not connected to like the Fairbanks, Anchorage, Homer grid. Okay, so... Now, why do we talk about this? Like, why do we care where we're getting our electricity from? You know, like, why does this matter? Um, well, climate change is a big motivator for me. Obviously, we think about reducing our fossil fuel use. It is not our only motivator, though. Energy costs, so Alaskan residents generally pay double the national average. Um, so we have the second highest electricity prices in the U.S. at 24 cents per kilowatt hour. Hawaii is the only one that is higher than us, at least on average, like what the average person pays. But of course, in some communities in Alaska, uh, a lot more of them are, they're paying a lot more than what that average price is. You know, that 24 cents is closer to what we're paying in like Fairbanks, Anchorage, Matsu, Kenai Peninsula. Whereas the national average is closer to 11 or 12 cents per kilowatt hour. And we have, uh, you know, the fourth highest energy consumption per capita, but a lot of that is because of our heating need. We have such a high heating need throughout the state. So we also see that these costs have gone up over time. So here is, um, I didn't have a really nice graph of residential electricity rates. So this is like commercial and industrial, but um, so these numbers are lower than what our residential rate is, but that same trend is happening for our residential electricity rates as well. So we're seeing this where over time, you know, may not be, it just keeps happening slowly and incrementally, but really we're paying double what we used to pay for our electricity even 15, 20 years ago. So that electricity cost has been steadily increasing. We also see that for the cook and light gas, which is what provides the heat for our uh, for us again here in South Central, but also for electricity, because um, Fairbanks buys electricity from us too. So a lot of electricity throughout the uh, most populous area of the state. These costs for that cook and light gas has also been going up. The kind of topical thing about cook and light natural gas that's going on is that Hillcorp, who produces most of the natural gas for that heating and electricity that we use it for, they have uh, said that they are not guaranteeing any contracts for natural gas. So for the folks who buy that, like Homer Electric and Chugach Electric and Matanuska Electric, they're saying, hey, past year ending contracts, we're not guaranteeing that. We actually have decreasing natural gas reserves and we don't know, you know, we can't guarantee how much we're going to have. And so this, you know, we don't know what's going to happen next and kind of provides like a really strong need for thinking about how, you know, this energy and understanding where energy is coming from. So jumping into kind of these ecosystems of our Alaska energy use. There we go. Didn't want, didn't want to click over. There we go. <laughs> so, okay. So any questions so far? Kind of went through a lot of that quickly before I jump into an ecosystem. I kind of think about like regionality and some similarities that you see. So, so far, any questions? Not seeing anything in the chat, but they come up. We can come back to it too. All right. So I've mentioned this already that energy costs can really be different depending on where you live in the state. And of course, the resources available to you are really di different depending on where you live on the state. And so we kind of talk about these three energy regions in the state. And I will preface this by saying that there's some generalities. Obviously, each community is very unique and different. And so I don't want to minimize that. There are some commonalities that we can talk about that help us understand how energy is used in the state. So that's what I'm gonna try to do. Uh, but do understand, of course, that again, each community is very unique and different. 
So uh, one of the first region that I have referenced, but didn't, maybe didn't use this term was the rail belt. And so this is uh, this area from Fairbanks on down south to Homer. We also think about um, kind of Southeast Alaska and kind of lumping Kodiak in there. I'll explain why when I get to that here in a bit. And then we have interior and Western Alaska that's not included on that rail belt electrical grid. So I'm gonna talk about each of these really kind of energy ecosystem regions. So the rail belt, this is that continuous electrical power grid connecting Fairbanks to Homer. It's our largest grid in the state. It's still much smaller than any grid that you would see in the lower 48. It's managed by five utility companies. We're in the lower 48. Like I'm seeing some Oregon, Washington folks, that would be like one utility <laughs> that is managing this many um, megawatt hours that they produce, but it does supply electricity to 80% of our population. And it integrates multiple non-renewable and renewable energy resources. We're at about 22 cents per kilowatt hour for our average electricity is what we pay. And most of about 85% of that electricity um, is coming from non-renewable resources. And then the other um, about 15% is hydro. Then we have a mix of wind and solar and a little bit of um, biomass, which we'll talk about when I get to the clean energy source. So that's kind of the, the rail belt. This is where most of the people in the state live. This is where we get most of our electricity. Now in Southeast, this is um, our Southeast communities. And then we also kind of have Kodiak, Valdez and Cordova lumped in there with them because they are their own microgrids. So they are like Valdez, even though it's on the road system, it's not connected to our other grid that we have here as part of the rail belt. And they have a lot of hydro. So there's a lot of these systems, um, same thing with Kodiak and Cordova. And so I kind of include them as the sort of Southeast ecosystem because they have so much hydro on their grid. And um, there are a couple of communities that share a grid, but they're mostly microgrids, meaning they're standalone grids not connected to another grid. They're not connected to something in Canada. They're not connected to the rest of Alaska. They're their own standalone grid. And a lot of the communities um, have hydro, not all of them. Again, this is where I get into kind of some, don't want to overgeneralize because there are plenty of communities that don't have access to hydro, but many do. Several communities are even 100% renewable energy electricity. And their average cost of electricity is much lower because of that, because they have older hydro systems that are already paid off and they don't have those fuel costs. Again, those communities that don't have hydro and relying more on that diesel oil have a higher cost for electricity, but those uh, that lower cost is much, um, you see that a lot more often in these communities. And it drives electrification where those electric cars, heat pumps, uh, having an electric bus. There's a um, electric uh, terminal in Juneau for cruise ships. So it's because of that lower cost for electricity you have and really high cost for heating. So they don't have natural gas. You see more of that electrification. Okay. And so then our rural communities in interior and Western Alaska. So everything outside of what I've already mentioned. This is over 200 of these island or microgrid communities. And they rely very heavily on imported diesel fuel for electricity and heat. A lot of them do have renewable energy systems, but very, very few of those renewable energy systems are more than 50% of their electricity production, unlike what you see in Southeast Alaska. And so there are a lot of wind systems, uh, more and more solar systems, um, and we see a couple hydro systems as well, but again, not many of them are more than that 50% of their electricity production. And a lot of them have a subsidy of this power cost equalization <clears throat> where the residents um, have a, uh, their cost for electricity is lowered to closer to that of those of us on the rail belt system. Uh, the, I will note that this is only residents that get this schools and businesses do not get this lower cost for electricity. So schools, businesses pay this like 50 cents per kilowatt hour. Residents pay this 25 cents per kilowatt hour. 
All right. So those are kind of the general energy ecosystems in the state. I'll pause, take a drink of water and see if there's any questions so far. <clears throat> Okay, seeing none, I will continue. So let's talk a little bit about non-renewable energy resources. We have obviously a lot of resources uh, for that are non-renewable. We think about um, our natural, our oil, gas, and coal. Uh, we have some other renewable resources too, which I'll get to, but we're thinking about these three are what I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, nuclear is also non-renewable, but it's not something that we have access that we can actually have in state, right? That we're mining in state and there's not currently any systems on board right now. Um, those are five to 10 years in the future. So I'm not gonna talk about nuclear today other than saying maybe it'll happen in the future, but it's not currently a resource that we have. And uh, re since it's non-renewable, it's not something that we are pushing. So. Uh, oil, right? Like this is what people think about when they think about energy as an Alaska state. We think about oil, we think about the North Slope, we think about um, Prudhoe Bay. And so this is a reality. This is our existing, we have this, we have this pipeline that goes down to um, our Valdez that produces this oil. Now with this, I will say that we don't get a hometown discount on this oil. We actually don't have a lot of refineries in the state. A lot of times this oil, it's not like then we can use this in state. Most of it gets sent out of state to be refined before it then comes back and is distributed. Um, there is some that gets distributed. You can see this line here from Valdez over to Unalaska, tiny bit in Kodiak, but most of it is sent out of state and coming back. And so you can see these are the fuel distribution routes to rural markets. Um, and this is, there's a lot of issues with this. One being of course the price, uh, the impact by our changing climate in terms of unpredictable freezing of the rivers uh, and uh, different, sorry, sorry, phone call put up, should have put that down face down so I wasn't looking at it. Um, and so, and of course, uh, the environmental, potential environmental risk that is associated with this, uh, but it is the reality. And so this is how many of these communities are receiving fuel for their electricity and their heating. Now, when we think about coal, this is mostly, we're talking about Usabelli coal mine in Healy. And so I saw at least one GVEA member. And so this is where you get the coal and production for your electricity. Um, they have this combined heat and electric plant at UAF. Um, last I heard, it was the most recent coal plant that had been built in the United States was this one at Fairbanks. Um, that information is at least a year old, but probably still true. Well, this was it's one of the newer coal plants that have been built. Now we also have um, natural gas. I mentioned briefly that we have natural gas extraction that occurs on the North Slope. They use that for their electricity and for assisting in their oil extraction. We also have it in Cook Inlet, uh, which I mentioned. Hillcorp announced that they're no longer guaranteeing pa contracts past their current contracts. And here's a map showing some of those oil and gas platforms that they have on that out there in Cook Inlet. And um, REAP recently had a whole forum on this, like a two hour event talking about this Cook Inlet gas. So I'm not gonna spend a lot more time on that today. There are uh, links, that, a link at the end that I have that goes a lot more into that if you wanna learn more about that and ha can watch the recording from that event as well. Okay, so those are non-renewable resources. Now I'm gonna get to the fun part, talking about clean energy resources some of the awesome things that we've got in the state. And again, clean, when I'm saying clean, I mean efficiency and renewables, not nuclear or carbon sequestration or anything like that, specifically renewables and efficiency. And we very much wanna talk about efficiency first. Less than 5% of the world population 
the U.S. consumes about 18% of its energy. So there's a lot of energy consumption that is happening um, that is inefficient, that's wasted, and that we can do better at using energy. Now, if you want to think about it at your individual home level, this is a great resource, energy saving tips for Alaskas, for Alaskans. Um, there's great at-home behavior changes, upgrades, efficiency upgrades that you can do, and it's available for free to download. This is a great start. I do also want to mention, though, that this is only a small part of our energy use in the state. Think about, really want to be thinking about our system's energy use, where we, that industrial and transportation energy use was much higher in our state than our residential. There's great benefits to having much more efficient house. And if all of us do it, that is a great impact. Uh, but we also want to think about bigger scale efficiency. And so one of the things that I like to point out too, is that this is a busy slide to so stick with me here. Don't, I don't need to go through every little step, but part of this is that it is a very busy slide is that this is talking about extracting electricity from fossil fuels. There's a lot of steps that you have to do. Um, and this doesn't even show all the like extraction and transportation of the fuel, which adds even more steps. But once you have the fuel coming in, stored in a store tank, you might have some sort of vaporizer, you're burning it to have a boiler that moves the steam, which then moves the generator, which then goes to a transmission and then onto electricity, right? There's like a lot of steps that are involved in using electricity from fossil fuels. Now, fossil fuels have a lot of great stored energy, like the amount of energy in a gallon of gasoline is really incredible. It does take a lot of steps to get that and to be able to use that energy. And so when we think about renewable energy, you're taking out a lot of steps there, right? You don't have that extraction of the fuels. You don't have that transportation of the fuels. Um, you might, for some of them, like solar, you don't even have a generator, <laughs> right? So there's a lot fewer steps and that inherently has a lot of efficiency in it because there are so many fewer steps. Um, I, I meant to check the stat. I didn't have it in my notes here. So the, but it's something like 42% of the barges currently on the ocean right now are transporting fuels. So if you just think about the number of transportation amount of fuel that we use to transport other fuel that in itself is a huge efficiency as well so i really want to be thinking about these systems efficiencies how can we do this better how can we have better public transportation you know like there's so many other things here that we can think about for efficiency um and so that's what i want to say here is always efficiency first you don't want to be using more energy than you have to and now that I've done my spiel and my got my soapbox about efficiency, I'm going to jump into renewables. <laughs> so uh, the biggest renewable that we use in the state, as you saw, was hydro. So uh, here's Bradley Lake. This is a dam outside of Homer, across the bay from Homer, that produces um, actually a decent amount of electricity for the rail belt uh, for hydroelectricity. We also, and so that's one type of system. You also have uh, like a run of the river type system, like what you see in Cordova with their humpback creek set up. And so this is, uh, you know, in Alaska, we're really thinking about fish friendly hydro. Any type of dam that we're putting up is generally not impeding any fish systems or that we don't want to have that sort of system. You see that a lot in Alaska. Not that there aren't systems out there, but generally that's what you see in Alaska are systems that are pretty fish friendly. Now there's another type of hydro in Alaska called hydrokinetic, which is slightly different um, because you don't have a difference in height that you're taking advantage of like a waterfall or a dam or something. And so this is something that you see like in river. So Igiagig, uh, on at the uh, Chivak River, mouth of Lake Iliamna, they have this rib gen system that is now this is above the water here, but normally it's at the bottom of the river. And this was just like when it was being installed or maybe for maintenance, you can see, so you can see what it looks like, but normally it's at the bottom of the river. And so this is another type of way of producing electricity. And so tidal energy would be another type of hydrokinetic. 
And so um, it is a type of hydro and something that people are looking into uh, for Cook Inlet because it has such a huge tidal range. And so there is actually the same company that has this RivGen system and Igyagig is working on a test site in Cook Inlet as well. So they don't have something there yet, but they're working with Homer Electric and um, National Renewable Energy Lab for that project so that we will see something being tested there. So yes, another type of hydro. Um, here's another type of like in-river system called the Blade Runner that's being tested in Tanana. So some different systems that people are working on to be able to take, again, very fish friendly. They've had um, videos on these systems or cameras on these systems, I mean, where they can review the, the videos and they haven't seen any fish impacts. Doesn't mean there hasn't been any, but they at least haven't seen any yet. So hydro, we also see um, wind, of course, in Alaska, we have many number of these systems, even if they aren't producing a large percentage of our electricity production yet. So we have um, like really big systems, like what you see uh, outside of Anchorage on Fire Island um, or uh, and Kodiak has a really big system. Healy close to the coal uh, mine has a pretty big uh, system as well. And then you also see um, some smaller systems like this is, well, this is a, a, a larger side of a small system, but still smaller, Banner Creek Wind Farm in Nome. And then, a, as I mentioned before, a lot of communities, especially in Western Alaska, where they have a lot of wind resource, have some small wind turbines to supplement their electricity production. Now, solar is another great one. I have solar panels on my house, so I'm a big fan of solar. <laughs> I'm sure that does not surprise anybody. Someone who works for REAP has solar on their house, but still, it's great. I love it. And we actually have pretty similar insulation. So emphasize that SOL there, which is the amount of energy per square meter of a piece of land that you get from the sun. And so you can see like the energy per square meter is actually not that different from Germany, who's a huge leader in solar energy. So they have shown that it can be done, um, even if you don't have a beautiful solar resource like you see in this red here uh, in the Southwest, like that's where you think of like an amazing solar resource. Even if you don't have an amazing solar resource like that, you can still take advantage of it because you, you know, we have that, that insulation is per over the year. And so if you think about it, our insulation time is much more contracted and we can get some really great resources out of the full year. Heard my boss say like, well, you know, you use your car like 5% of the time and you still like to have it. So same thing like with your solar, <laughs> may not use it 100% of the time. But we still like to have it, can still have a great benefit. Um, there's some really cool solar projects, uh, even in more Northern Alaska. So Golden Valley Solar Farm and Fairbanks. Um, there's a lot of like water treatment plants, so Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium and the Northwest Arctic Borough have really demonstrated that you can put these solar systems even at really high northern latitudes and get a really great resource and a lot of benefit out of having that solar. Um, and the largest solar farm in the state is actually in Willow. And those same folks are looking at uh, or have already broken ground on a project in Houston, Alaska, <laughs> not Texas, but here in Alaska. And so that is going to be a six megawatt system, I believe. So seeing more and more solar happening in Alaska. So there's also geothermal and I put geo exchange in here, which I'll mention, I'll explain here briefly, but geothermal, they're pretty standard you know, think about hot springs area where you can capture that energy and turn it into heat and electricity. Iceland is really famous for this, where they are one of the leaders in renewable energy because they can produce most of their heat and electricity from geothermal. And so they have a lot of renewable energy production in their country. So there's a really small system in China Hot Springs. Um, they are exploring some uh, volcano outside of Unalaska. And then there's something related but different called geo exchange. So these are heat pumps. 
And so you can do, this is an example here I have of an air source heat pump, but this can also be down out of the ground or the water. So Seward Sea Life, for example, Seward Sea Life Center, for example, has a water source heat pump. They were already pumping water for their systems, for the animals that they have. Um, and then they're actually able to capture some heat out of it as well. And so they're producing a lot of their heat throughout the winter from their water source heat pump. And the way that heat pumps work is that they move heat. They're not generating heat. Like you think about like a plug-in electric resistance heater. They use electricity, but they move heat. They use a compressor just like you have in your refrigerator. That the refrigerator is moving heat out of that space. You can feel like and the coils in the back get really warm. And so these heat pumps do the same thing where they can cap, they can move some of that heat that's in the air outside. Even on cold days, there's you know more <laughs> than absolute zero. There's always something, some sort of heat that's in there, and they can move it into your house. Now, the colder it gets, the less efficient it gets, but they have systems that work all the way down to 20 below. And generally what I've heard is that it's actually fairly efficient down to about zero. Depends on your system and the space that you have. So that's not a hard and fast rule, but it is something that can be used. They also have um, ground source heat pumps, like the Juno Airport has one to help keep their runways clear. And there are a couple, um, like pools in the state that actually use a ground source heat pump to help heat their water in their pool because that's a huge energy use as well. So these are things that are being used in the state. Air source heat pumps, even on the North Slope, are not, well, North Slope Borough, not necessarily North Slope, all the way North Slope, but in that borough, that area, they are using them, not in the middle of winter, but in spring to fall. And it is so effective and it offsets even that much oil that it was still beneficial for them to be able to use it, even if they can't use it in the middle of winter. You see a lot in Southeast. Remember I said that electrification is happening in Southeast. You're seeing a, a lot of this happening like in Juneau and Sitka um, where they are getting more and more heat pumps. Milder climate, lower cost for electricity. Okay, the last uh, renewable energy source is biomass. And now uh, biomass, of course, is renewable only if you're sustainably harvesting. I do want to put that caveat. This is not talking about like um, clear cutting or bringing in outside biomass sources. This is talking about local sustainable harvest of biomass. So for example, uh, in Toke, they have to, they're in there. And I will say there was some like, like clear cutting isn't the right word, but a fire break that they were doing um, that they have to do anyway to help protect the towns. They're doing that anyway, and they're able to take that uh, fuel that was being harvested, those trees that were being harvested and chip them. And they use that to heat the school in Toke. <laughs> and so they're able to use those resources. Uh, like where I live here at, in South Central, there's a lot of beetle kill spruce. So we've been cut, cutting down a lot of those black spruce trees that have been killed and dead already from that beetle kill, and we're using that to supplement our heat source. So this is an example of when sustainably done, this is a renewable resource. Uh, there's also biomass, it's not just wood, all right? It actually could be anything that was just most recently living. And one of the cool things that happens in Anchorage um, is that they capture methane from the landfill. So now any landfill that you have, um, once it gets big enough, you have decomposition that is happening. And that decomposition from like paper products, food, all that sort of thing releases methane because there's microbes that are in there breaking that down. It releases methane and methane is basically natural gas. <laughs> That's most of like the main component of natural gas. So you can capture that methane and landfills have to flare this anyway. That's like they're required to burn this anyway if they're not using it. And so they capture this and instead of just flaring it like they do on the North Slope, they burn it to produce electricity. And this produces electricity for the uh, base, actually, for Fort Rich. This is one of their sources for electricity. It's considered renewable because it's coming from that breakdown and is already occurring anyway, not something that is being captured from Cook Inlet. And so you can also, biomass could also be things like fish oil. Um, so there's like an Alaska, 
Uh, they had a fish oil processor that was using fish oil for a while for their electricity production. And, you know, so there's different ways, uh, waste oil, um, like from restaurants can be turned into biofuel. So there's different things that this biomass can include, not just uh, our kind of wood that we think about for biomass. Now, with all the benefits of renewables of helping offset fossil fuels um, and having some more efficiencies that are involved in that and using local resources, there are of course limitations <laughs> to using renewable energy resources. We don't, um, you know, it's a lot of them are an intermittent resource, so it's unpredictable. Like, uh, you know, you don't know exactly when the wind is going to be blowing or how much the sun sets every night. <laughs> you know, it's reduced by cloud cover. Um, it can also be technologically difficult, especially for really small microgrid systems to switch back and forth between renewable energy and fossil fuel. Remember, we don't have like a really big grid. Even our biggest grid still is pretty small compared to lower 48. So we don't have like a big grid pull from other resources. So that can be difficult. Um, lack of local training. Some technologies like hydrokinetic or tight, you know, tidal resource, that technology just isn't quite there yet. Um, and so we don't have it all there. Funding can be difficult. And so there's really no magic bullet. You know, there's not like, I can't just say, oh yeah, if we all just do solar and battery, <laughs> like that would fix our problems. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't just say like, there's one thing that we can do. It's so dependent on each community on how they can actually do this. I do want to quickly read something that actually came from, uh, I'll know my book, it's called Alaska Energy Issues and Trends that was just published. I'm gonna read something really briefly from, this was published by the university. And they, uh, the link is at, the, at my end slide too, so you guys will be able to read this. This is what they say about Alaska's Arctic oil common, economy. The lack of revenue diversity in the state of the global hydrocarbon economy, which Alaska cannot control or direct. So I'm still working. I said internet unstable. Hopefully you can still hear me okay. Yeah, just I think it paused it for again? just a second, but yeah. Okay, I'll read that again. Thank you. It's an important statement, so I don't want to get it missed. The lack of revenue diversity in the state ties its citizens and businesses to the boom and bust cycle of the global hydrocarbon economy. So that's like oil, gas, right? Which Alaska cannot control or direct. This creates uncertainty in the state's economy that can disincentivize business investment and cause instability for individual households, particularly outside of the rail belt. Diversification of the state's economy can buffer private and public sector jobs, investment and government budgets, and can provide opportunities for innovation, innovative economic and technological advances to foster job growth for residents. So this is what they're saying about the economy is that the issue is that we don't have diversification. We focus so much on oil extraction for our um, for our budgeting, right? For our costs, and so much on natural gas, especially in like I said, that was eighty percent of our population is focusing so much on natural gas for our electricity and our heating, and so we don't have a diversification. We don't have anything to stand on. So yeah, I don't have a magic bullet to tell you guys of like, hey, let's do this one thing to fix it, <laughs> but the the thing is, the magic bullet is diversification, is doing a bunch of things. We need to do a lot of things to be able to have ourselves make sure that we have a just and equal energy future for everybody. So diversification is the key. And I am going to now jump into some of these solutions that we talk about. Am I doing on time? Okay. I'll, I'll make sure I can uh, still leave a few minutes then. Talk, I knew I told you I was talking too much. So let me talk about some of these solutions. Too much information here. Now, if you remember, I said that we have those four pillars for increasing clean energy in the state. So we need to have the technology, need to have funding for the technology, need to have policy to support it, and you need to have the people to make it happen. So you need those four things all working together 
to have increased clean energy. So I'm going to talk about some things in each of those that we are seeing that we hope that is happening or that might be happening or that we'd like to happen. So technology, really the next big thing we see is storage and electrification. So we're already having advancement in storage. We have like really big batteries. We have these thing called flywheels, um, pumped hydro. People are talking about hydrogen fuel cells. And then we also have electrification, uh, which I mentioned before. Uh, ex explain that briefly in terms of switching things that normally use fossil fuels like our cars, or our heating, or our cooking stoves, and using efficient electric systems. And so that in itself is more efficient using electric systems. And as our electricity is switched to more renewables, that efficiency just keeps adding up. So that's one way you can think about technology, along with the other things that I mentioned in terms of our renewable energy, um, like our hydrokinetic systems uh, and improved wind that we're seeing come through. Now, funding, one of the things we talk about is green financing specifically their interest in a state green bank. Um, and so basically how a green bank works is that it helps leverage private capital and stuff from private banks or other credit unions, and then combines them together to provide incentives, either using state incentives or their own incentives to be able to make funding more accessible. So instead of having you know, like you can go and get a car loan, right? Like we figured out how to do car loans really efficiently and you can do it for a fairly low interest rate, but we don't have the same thing for like solar panels or a heat pump, <laughs> right? And so that's the sort of thing that a green bank can do is to be able to support those sorts of programs and develop those types, generally loans. And so it pays for itself because you it gets paid back in interest. And so Connecticut, Green Bank is an example of this. Um, there might also be a national green bank that comes out of the Infrastructure Reduction Act that then the state could use funding from that national green bank to be able to set up our own. And there is interest on this um, across the political spectrum because it's good financial sense. I won't go into all the details because I'm already running out of time, but I got links for you to learn more about it. Uh, policy, renewal portfolio standard is something that REAP would like to see. And so this would require the rail uh, utilities on the rail belt to source 80% of their electricity from renewables um, by a certain date. They're still like deciding what that date would be. 2040 or 2050 is generally. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate your time. It was generally what we're looking at. National Renewable Energy Lab did an assessment that said, yes, this is doable and would save around 500 million every year by doing this. They don't have a study yet on how much it would cost to get there, but they're currently working on that. And we hope to see that soon. Um, and then of course, the Infrastructure Reduction Act. Uh, this is a slide that I took from a presentation I saw the other day from someone at the Department of Energy. A lot of great things that are coming from that at the household individual level that we'll be able to see like home energy rebates, energy grid industry, um, environmental justice block grants, rural energy assistance, some really great things that we're going to see coming. Now the people, this is like workforce development and this is like, so my wheelhouse, right? Cause I'm the education. So I do like, so this is a lot of the stuff that I do. This is, we have a curriculum for teachers to use. We do teacher trainings, we do class visits, we do summer camps. I'm developing this career booklet to be able to share so that folks know about the careers. Um, will hopefully be available at the end of the month. And then we also have Alaska Network for Energy Education and Employment. I mean, there's a lot of things that we do at REAP that is really focused on this. It's not like there's any one thing, but a lot of stuff that we do that helps, that we are hoping will help support this workforce development. So we have the folks, as we get the technology and the funding, the projects come online, we got folks who can do it, can build it. So here are those further resources, links. Again, these slides I will share with Alex so that they can send them out with every, but with the, the recording and anybody who couldn't attend. So you guys be able to do this. Some really cool resources um, to be able to check out. So thank you, Koyana. Whew, look at that, seven minutes to spare. Make sure I had time for questions and discussion. All right, so Koyana <laughs> uh for your time and questions, discussions. 
stop the share so I can like see people, not just my slides. That was so interesting. Thank you for sharing so much information. Yeah, if anyone wants to come off mute and say hello and ask any questions, I'd love to hear from folks. Hi, yeah, this is Eileen. I don't have my uh, video on, but I just have my my lovely <laughs> picture waving at you. Um, yeah. Just a couple of thoughts, not necessarily questions. Um, I, it seems, first of all, it, it struck me the irony of uh, 58 or so percent of energy being used by transportation and, oh, sorry, by of uh, transportation cost due to industry and the industry happens to be gas and coal, sorry, gas and oil. So that's an interesting aspect. Um, diversifying away from that should reduce that energy usage. Um, and the other thought I know, um, just my daughter was up at UAF. And so I spent a lot of time visiting and just talking to different people there. And um the PFD, is that what it's called, um, is tied to gas and oil. And even though it's only been around, well, I was, I'm going to say 50 years, that's two full generations of people who think that is a given. I mean, I'm, I'm old enough to know why. I mean, I, I went to school with people who built the pipeline. So, you know, I'm old now. There was a time when that didn't exist. Um, but I think I, I sense that that, may be an issue for people as diversifying away from gas and oil as a primary industry is going to perhaps ultimately do away with that fund. So that is a, not a question, just, just an observation. <laughs> those are, no, those are great observations. It's not an easy road ahead of us. And I really appreciate you bringing up those points. Thank you, Eileen. Um, other, I see Alicia and Frank, I think are both unmuted. Would you like to share some thoughts? I, yeah. uh, I enjoyed your presentation. Like